Hi, so this is Samantha Tong from Love Akita Marketing, again speaking to uh, another expert uh, in all around marketing. Uh, this time it's Nick Brooks. Um, so over to you, Nick, can you uh, uh, give us a bit of background about you? Okay, yeah, hi. Um, I ran a business to business marketing communications agency for, for about 40 years. Um, we specialised really in the manufacturing and industrial sectors. Uh, and over that time, I've worked, or we did as a team, um, with clients large and small, so from small to medium-sized companies, small manufacturing businesses, small service businesses, etc. cetera, um, maybe turning over two, three, four, five million pounds through to global multinationals, uh, the likes of 3M, SKF, Suez, etc. Which, uh, so which is exactly real... why we know each other, because... I... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, our, 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 <laughs> uh, uh, our paths cross whilst I was working for one of those big multinationals Nick was just mentioning. Now, today we're going to be talking about uh, inbound marketing. Now, not everyone watching this video probably knows what that means. Um, Nick, do you want to do a brief uh, description mm. of what inbound marketing is? Okay, fine. All right. Well, perhaps I can start by just putting it into context. Um, if you think about um, the way we all buy things today, most of us anyway, uh, it tends to be based on online. Um, and when that started, and of course that process accelerated during lockdown, um, but when the, the shift from traditional, if I can call it that, methods of buying things to the online world um, happened, it tended to be for lower value items, books, CDs, whatever it might be. But now we're seeing it the same rationale applying to much higher value items. As an example, um, I recently bought a new car just for Christmas. Um, I didn't go to a dealer, which I would have done originally in the past. I did all of my research online. Um, I decided on the spec I wanted. And it was only at that point when I th that I then contacted the local dealer to say, right, this is what I want. What's the best price you can do? And the only time I met the dealer is when I went in to collect the car. So I didn't bother with a test drive or anything like that because I'd, I'd done my research and I know enough about cars over the years to, to do that. Um, so that was a sort of £30,000 purchase or thereabouts. But it's it can be bigger than that. And I remember a year or so ago for one of our clients, um, they won a £6 million order purely and simply through a web inquiry that came through their website. Um, the point here is that that prospect had already shortlisted this particular company before they even contacted them. And I think alongside that change in the online online buying behaviour, there's also been a decline in the effectiveness of things like cold calling. I'm not saying cold calling is dead, it's just far less effective than it used to be. You know, um, There's lots of research around, but I think that most of the studies tend to show that it typically takes around about eight, eight attempts to get through to a decision maker. And when you do, a very small number of those calls actually result in any form of, of conversion. Unless you happen to catch them after they've already done the research and they're, oh, you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Unless you get very lucky. <laughs> That's right. Um, I think the key thing really perhaps is that none of us like being interrupted, yeah. you know, and we want to take control of our buying decisions. So, you know, doing that online is great because we've not got anybody, you know, a sales rep breathing out down our neck saying, oh, buy this, buy this, etc. cetera. Um, and it's only when we're ready that we want to engage with potential suppliers. So I think this is where inbound marketing comes in. So sorry if I've taken a lot longer to get to the answer to your question, but I think I just thought it was important to put it into context. Definitely. So inbound marketing effectively is trying to create an environment, an ecosystem, if you like, where people come to you in the first instance. You know, I used the six million pound order that I just mentioned for, for a client a, few, a year or two ago. You know, they were very successful at creating this sort of ecosystem online where it's easy for people to find them, easy to understand what they did, easy to understand what they offered and why they should purchase from them. And I think one of the keys to, to um, inbound marketing is fundamentally it's not about selling. I mean, clearly that's the ultimate goal, yeah. but it's much more about helping customers by attracting, engaging and delighting them really with great ideas, insight, inspiration. That's part of what, you know, marketers, marketers have always said to, to clients over the years. You need to position your business as an authority, as the leading business in this sector, whatever that is. You know, whether it's whether it's marshmallows or whether it's industrial sensors, doesn't matter. Uh, we're the company to trust. And this is inbound marketing really takes that perhaps to an, a, another level. 
Um, so I can't stress that enough. It's about helping, not selling, because if you help people, provide them ideas and insight, they'll naturally come to you when they're ready to buy. Yeah, yes. So um, in terms of the uh, informing people, I guess, guess back in the day, uh, if people aren't used to the, the, the current technology, I guess back in the day, that's what PR was all about. Um, in many respects, yeah. Yeah, Good yeah, PR, yeah. Anyway. yeah. And, uh, whereas now we do use different tools, like, I guess uh, you, it'd be blogs and social media posts, all, all this stuff, but always stuff that's useful, not just, not just yeah. I'm my stuff. I think that's the key thing. And I think, I mean, I always used to say this to clients, particularly engineering businesses, because they might have developed a fantastic solution, you know, a great product. And rightly, they're very proud of it. And they want to tell the world about it. But what they always forget is nobody cares. Ultimately, nobody cares about what you as a business can do or are doing. What they do care about is the difference you can make to their life, to their business, to their profitability, or whatever it might be. That's the key thing. I don't care that you've got the, the best spirit wrangler or whatever it might be in the world. What I care about is what is that going to make a difference to my life, to my business, to my customers? And I think people forget that when they're selling because they're so keen to talk about their own product. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I have had a few clients come to me. I want you to write a blog on this product yeah um which isn't always i always try and turn that around into okay so what is this pro product what is the problem that this product is solving let's talk about yeah. the problem first and then we can you know very bottom of the blog maybe we mention yeah what the solution is yeah definitely I, I think that's right because ultimately you know and if you think about how we search for things online you know um, how do I change a light bulb or how do I whatever you know it's it's looking for information we're looking for answers to questions because we've got a problem or a challenge that we want to overcome so you're right if you're writing your blog posts in a way that answer those questions that a, does two things a it's great for us if search which yes. is key that in an inbound marketing strategy having good content on your website so that google loves it and you rank highly um, but it also makes the blog post much more readable and much more informative to, to, yeah. to the prospect. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because unless you already know you're looking for a specific product, product, you're not going to sit there and read a blog about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what are the sort of different tools? If someone wants to start um, doing inbound marketing, bringing leads in through their website, Mm -hmm. What are the sorts of tools that, um, especially in a B2B environment, we need to start thinking about? Okay. Well, I think, first of all, probably a lot of us are already doing stuff that is that fits into the environment. You know, a lot of companies are already blogging. They might have a LinkedIn channel or a Facebook channel or whatever the appropriate social media channels are for their business and their market. But what most companies tend to fail to do is they look at the, or what they tend to do is they focus on the tactics. Mm -hmm. So they write lots of blog posts. Great. But why are they writing the blog posts? What do their customers really want? So my the starting point really should be understand your customers, understand their pains, their challenges, what makes them tick. Now, where do you get that information is the first challenge in many respects. If you've got an existing field sales team, then they're probably the source of that knowledge, because if they're good, then they will know the answers to some of those questions. And I think here, particularly for larger organisations where they have a defined marketing and sales department, quite often they sit in little silos. And I've always said they should all sit in the same room, all talk to each other, because if you do that, you get much more insight and, and a much better overall result. It's amazing, actually, if you develop, it's, it's something that, that I've done, um, it's come up in a few videos. In fact, one of my videos was entirely about this subject, how closely right. marketing and sales should work together. And yeah, yeah. It was certainly, uh, they, they're fonts of knowledge, them and customer services as well. Yes, often, yeah, good point. Yeah, Because uh, they're the ones talking to the customers. Yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes you, you, you you know, you, you know, uh, you know, camp, you might think, oh, th this is a great campaign or speak to the customer, but actually they have a completely different concern than the one you're talking about. So you need to, yes. as you say, you yeah. need to make sure that you actually understand the audience first. I'm really glad yeah. you said, uh, you know, or make sure that you, uh, you know, the, the, the strategy is important first because that's, that's uh, that's my bag. Absolutely, it's it. Yeah. I can't do, do anything without knowing what your objectives are first. Uh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. With with uh, if you're going to be an authority, you can't be an authority if you don't actually understand what your customers really. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other element to it is it's having realistic targets. So you, you're absolutely right. You've got to understand your marketplace. You've got to understand your customer. Now, a lot of companies will say, well, of course we do. We sell successfully to them. Yeah, but quite often they're not selling as much as they could be selling. And they're selling because there's little competition or whatever it might be. Um, and they can do, always, I would argue, even if you're selling and you're successful, you can always do more. And often the key to that is truly understanding and, and digging deep beneath your, mm. with your customers. Because there's another, another element here as well. If you go to a customer and say, great, so I'd like to know more about your business. Tell me about your biggest challenges. And they'll say, well, quality is an issue or productivity is an issue, or we need to improve the, re the, the resilience of our IT system from cyber attacks. Great. If you then press them a little bit further and say, but why is that important? And why is a very, is a lovely word, you know, why is that important to you? Why is it going to make a difference to you? You actually start by pushing harder and digging a bit more with your questioning. You start to get beneath what they say is the reason, i.e. we want to become more productive, to what perhaps is the real reason to them as an individual, which is my manager's beating me up because we have a lot of downtime on our lines and I need to get it fixed. They're dressing that up as we want to produce more, which is ultimately what they're trying to do. Yeah. But the reality of it is they've got a personal issue with their manager and they don't know how to solve it. Yeah, and I'm not exactly. suggesting we stray into HR here, but Maybe, and if that keeps coming up, but you know, multiple sales guys are telling you this is the conversation I'm having with my with a, you know our customers. You know that is something that you need to be talking to to them about. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I think the other element to it from a starting point of view is understand your market, think about the challenges and, and pain points and what they're interested in, what their real needs are. Then you can start thinking about developing a content plan and we can talk about content perhaps in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, but the other element to it is understand which customers are the best customers which customers are your worst customers and understand why, because what you don't want to be doing is carrying on selling to companies that actually are just a pain in the neck, never really buy as much as they should do and always haggle on price and try, try and drive your margins through the floor. What you want is customers that really appreciate what you do as a business, value your products or services, etc. So it's understanding those different types of customers, first of all, and then really focusing your efforts where they need to be focused and part of that as well is doing a proper a proper analysis of your sales figures understand things simple things like what are your conversion rates what's your lead to sale conversion rate you know um, what's your average lifetime customer value tie that back into what are your business goals well you don't and over the years a number of times i've spoken to clients at a senior level and said right what are you trying to achieve with the business? Where do you want to take it? Where's it going to be in a few years time? What's your business plan look like? Worryingly, quite a lot of companies don't have business plans, particularly smaller ones. Yeah. So that's a, that's, that's a, a big, separate big issue. Let's yeah. presuppose they do. They'll say, well, our target is 10% year on year growth. Great. Where's that coming from? Well, we're going to launch a new product. And what difference is that going to make? And if you do launch it, how many sales do you need to achieve in terms of value to give you that 10% year on year growth? What's your conversion ratio? Most companies, it's about 25 to 35%. Therefore, how many leads do you need to generate at what value, et cetera, et cetera. And it's understanding that and having a clear set of statistics, if you like, facts and figures that, that inform both your business planning, but also can then be fed back into your marketing and sales strategy. Yes. So there's quite a lot you need to do up front before getting started on inbound marketing. Yes. Yes, yes. Otherwise, you can waste a lot of time and money on um, marketing, you know, marketing that's not actually going to achieve anything or not going to achieve what you need it to achieve, attract the wrong customers yeah. or wrong yeah. message or whatever. I agree. And I think another element to it is as well, which which cuts across all marketing, really, but particularly true of inbound marketing, perhaps, is just understanding how your brand is understood in the market how it's valued is it recognized in many instances because a lot of small companies you know they might be very successful but nobody's ever heard of them yeah you know there's no brand identity there because all so all these different factors come into play um and need to be considered at the outset yes because um i mean inbound marketing we're talking about um lead generation really but you also need to balance that with uh brand awareness yes yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I mentioned the word trust earlier on when I said, you know, positioning a business as an authority, the company you trust that you want to do business with. And brand plays a very important part. You know, there are brands we trust and brands we feel ambivalent about and brands we wouldn't touch with a barge pole for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. And it's understanding all of that as well. And yeah. if you're if you fall into the latter two categories, never heard of them, don't know much about them, or wouldn't touch them with a barge pole, if that's how your brand is perceived in the marketplace, then you obviously need to start addressing that as well across your broader marketing and sales uh, strategies, but arguably as well within your inbound marketing strategy. Because if there are problems, let's say you've got a bad reputation for product failures in the market or something, you know, unreliable products. You know, I can remember the days in the car world when Fiat, um, Lance, yeah, Alfa Romeo had a terrible reputation for rusting faster than, you know, you looked at them, they fell apart. They've cleared, you know, they, they've addressed that over the years, um, but it's took them quite a long time to change that reputation. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, or worse, uh, I think in some ways, sometimes it's even worse having no reputation. So they've literally never heard mm. of you. Why should they listen to you? Yeah, that's um, a very so there's good There's an element point. of that, I think, as well. Yeah, I think so. I think the other element to it as well, you know, and this cuts across a number of these things, is we're all working in a very noisy environment. You know, the online space, you know, you do a search for, I, don't know, I used how do I change a light bulb earlier on, you do a search for that and you'll get, thousands and thousands, probably tens and hundreds of thousands of results. Well, how do you make your specific voice as the leading seller of energy efficient light bulbs or something? How do you make your, how do you make your voice stand out amongst all that noise? Yeah. And you as a business as well, you know, you might think, well, we compete online with our direct competitors, other manufacturers or sellers of light bulbs, but actually you're competing with everything online because we're all being bombarded with messages from all sorts of sources all of the time yes yeah and i think that sort of connects to you you mentioned content plan the sorts of content mm. at the right stage of the customer journey as well yes yeah um how much information that, that you, we're bombarded with messages every day even technical people only have so much time and the first point of contact probably shouldn't be a data sheet a no. real real detailed data <laughs> sheet about a product no not at all and sadly, it sometimes is. Sadly, that's sometimes all there is. You know, mm. you go to a company's website and you, you, it's all about their products and attached to each one is a data sheet. Well, great, but it's not really answering the questions that I want answered in most instances. Um, but yeah, a content plan is, is very important. Once you've done all of that initial planning that we talked about a few minutes ago, I think you're then in a position to actually say, right, Let's think about the journey the customer goes through from the point of ha having a problem or, or needing of defining their challenge to the point of making a purchase. And you can then start to think, OK, so what are the things that they can do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is research online. You know, mm. how do I change a light bulb, for example? So your first content needs to answer those questions. Yeah. It's not about hit. We've got a great light bulb because they're not looking for that at that point. They're, they're looking for an answer to their, their problem. Once you've done that, then the next stage is then starting to lead them down the path towards your particular solution. So that's as things develop where the content perhaps becomes a bit more specific to your offering. Equally important in all that, of course, is if you've got them as testimonial, customer testimonials or case studies, because then again, and this is particularly true for companies that might not have a good strong brand. If they've got some great case studies on their website or in amongst their content but actually from other customers that say these guys were great in helping us solve this problem um then as a prospective purchaser that just gives you a little bit more confidence you know because the chances are whoever the case study is about you might be aware of in your market sector particularly if it's for a bigger brand you know if you if it's a small company but they've provided a solution for i don't know 3m or somebody then as the next potential customer is thinking, well, it was good enough for 3M. Maybe it's good enough for me. You know, it just, yeah. it just adds that little bit of credibility and, and a little bit more confidence. It's all part of that building that trust picture. Yes. And the, the other element of uh, case studies here, yeah, you, you've got that sort of, I suppose, in B2C, you, you, people call it social proof. It's, it's kind of yeah. similar concepts. But the other thing that's great about case studies is it's a story. People engage with stories oh, yeah. a lot better than yeah. a lot of other content. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you know, you you mentioned the blog post earlier on. That's a story in many yeah. respects because you're you know the once upon a time starter is setting the scene. You know, yeah. you're you're talking about the challenge, the problem that people are trying to overcome, and then leading them towards the solution. You know, the the end of the the happy ending, as it were. And a case study is very much like that. And I, I think a lot of people tend to think, particularly of my generation, tend to think of case studies as being written pieces, you know, nicely illustrated with photographs. Actually, some of the most powerful case studies are video these days. Yes. And, and testimonials as well. Just yeah. Short testimonial yeah. video. I, th I think it's important to have different formats of uh, yeah. content. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Yeah, because we all consume materials, content, if you like, in different ways. Yeah. You know, my background is, is copywriting and, and written material. So I tend to prefer to read things. But a lot of people, particularly the younger generation, they're so used to everything being video, that tends to be their first port of call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think also, it, it also helps embed things in people's minds if they've come across things in different formats, they're more likely yeah. to remember it. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's an important point when you think about the content journey and the type of content that, that people need to create. You know, the first thing might be they come across might be a blog post on how to change a light bulb. But if there's then an associated video with it that actually shows the process, great. Um, and I know when I'm looking for things, for example, go back to my mini purchase, for example, my car purchase for Christmas. Um, I was watching reviews online on, on YouTube of the particular model that I was looking at. Um, and that was great because some of them were all about the performance but others were more about the technical aspects of the vehicle which you know both are an important aspect to it and it was yes. it was very useful for only 10 or 15 minute pieces but that just helps to give you a picture of what you're thinking about buying and answering some of the questions you know is it reliable is it is the other wheels going to fall off after 2000 miles or whatever it might be and that, that brings me on to something else because car purchases are kind of famously um for a certain percentage of people who buy cars, the majority of the research they do is actually post-purchase. A sort of yes, that's right. They yeah. know they've made the right decision, and sometimes <laughs> that's true in B two B as well. Um, yeah. Especially yeah. If it's, it's it's something that could go wrong if it, you know yeah. it could cause serious problems if it goes wrong. Um, so I guess that's another thing to think about um, in the customer journey. It's actually you need some content for post-purchase. Yeah. Absolutely. And particularly if it's going to be a repeat customer, you know, you might be yes. selling them consumables, you, know, you want them to come back. Yeah. Um, there's another element to that as well, actually thinking about it, is that what I think we tend to forget is, you know, we're selling to people. And quite often, once we've gone past, once we've got to talk to the prospective customer, they've gone, they've done all their online research, etc., shortlisted a potential supplier, and they've they've, they've accepted a, a call from us or a meeting or a visit or whatever, a team's call. Um, we tend to think that the person we're speaking to must be the decision maker. And quite often, mm. you used to say, I used to see this a lot with different client sales forces. They would take that initial contact at face value, which is fine, but they wouldn't dig beyond it and actually say, to, to, they wouldn't try and find out if, I'm gonna, if you're going to buy from me, is there anybody else that needs to be in the room that is part of the decision making process? Yeah. And quite often, there was some research done a few years ago by CEB, who now I think are part, part of Gartner. And they found that on average for a B2B purchase above about $10,000, so not a huge value, yeah. um, there were typically 6.8 people involved in the purchasing decision, 6.8. I have no idea what 0.8 of a person looks like, but anyway, <laughs> park that for a minute. You know, like there were a lot- yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, there are a lot of people involved. So that might be if it's in a you know in an industrial context, the decision maker might be the engineering director, but he or she is probably going to defer as, or at least take advice from maybe somebody in quality, maybe somebody in maintenance, maybe certainly somebody in procurement, and so on. So they're going to be influenced by other people around them. So when we're selling, particularly if it's a higher value product. Or service we've got to think about that and think okay i've i need to reach out and i need to produce coming back to our content i need to produce content for those different people that are involved in that process so procurement they're going to be interested in payback for example return on investment cost of total cost of ownership those types of things um, whereas engineering and maintenance are going to be interested in a different set of criteria so you need to produce content that works for both or that's, multiple that's parties effectively um yeah so, so i've got a few clients that have different um different audiences 
involved in the purchase of the same product or service and we've yeah. got to produce content for each of them yeah 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 and they, they've often got completely different ideas about what's important um, yeah very yeah. much so and coming back to my point about asking why sometimes you need to try and speak to all of them to find out why the purchase is important to them because there will be as you rightly say many different reasons and you've got to find a way of addressing those reasons yes yes absolutely absolutely so so when you've got all this content yeah what's the best way to to start getting it out there make sure customers see it and to then get that content to convert to something that pulls them back to the website and pulls them back into Mm. actually uh turning into an actual potential customer an actual yeah I, the, I, we're back to, in many respects, traditional or conventional marketing techniques here because there's only so, you know, the marketing toolbox only has so many tools yes. in it. So I think that we, we've got, in the digital space as well as the offline space, we've got lots of channels open to us. So we've touched, both referred to social media. Yeah. Clearly, that's a good one. I mean, in the B2B environment, LinkedIn is probably the most common channel. Yeah. I don't think you can say it's the only channel. I think other ones okay. are used. Yeah, and we shouldn't lose sight of the shouldn't lose sight of the fact that while somebody in their professional capacity might be on LinkedIn, when they get home, they might go on Facebook or whatever the modern equivalent is, um, and on those channels. So you know, you should also think about that as well, because with a lot of the Facebook advertising, etc., you can still define your audience, whether they're you know design engineers or whether they're um, truck drivers or whatever it might be. Um, so social media, I, I would say, don't discount anything just because you think it's if you're in B2B, don't discount the other non B2B channels just because you think, well, our audience won't be on there. They're human beings you're selling to. They'll be on you, lots of these different things. So that's one element. PR you touched on earlier. Definitely um, use your trade, technical, commercial business media. And if you've got good, informed content, as you rightly alluded to, that makes great PR anyway. You know, most most trade publications, even today, those that are left, um, still want good, informed material. You know, they still want people's opinions. They still want solutions to problems, all this type of thing. So if you're producing good, solid content that is truly insightful, informative, that helps rather than sells, that by default becomes great PR material. Um, if you're using a marketing automation platform, something like HubSpot, for example, then you've clearly got a very powerful, assuming it's been set up correctly and you've got the right data and so forth in there. Yeah. But you've got a very powerful tool there to reach out to your target audience, either through email or whatever it might be. Um, and if that's linked into your website as well, even better, because like all of these things, you need to monitor what you're doing, see what's working, understand why it's working, see what's not working understand just as importantly why that's not working and then you can refine and improve constantly improve seo is key and we've touched on that a couple of times i wouldn't profess to be an seo expert but i do know it's a a vital part of the inward inbound marketing um, kind of toolbox as it were um you've got content you can use it as trade shows you you use it offline events as well yeah yeah. Um, don't don't forget face to face (laughs) Absolutely. And whether that's video that, you know, you're running a a TV monitor on your your exhibition stand, or if it's a bit more detailed content, like a sort of uh, you you run a webinar or something of that nature, usually the content for that webinar makes great material for a face to face presentation. Most trade events, most exhibitions will have breakout areas where companies can go and talk about a particular topic. Um, If you've created good, solid content in the form of a presentation or webinar, it's easy to adapt for a, a seminar or a conference presentation. Yeah. Um, so I've probably missed a few things, but I, I would say basically all of the traditional conventional marketing channels are appropriate for pumping your content out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think I think people, I think email and social media is free, uh, especially yeah. with organic social media as opposed to paid for. Uh, yeah. And therefore, that's what they should be focusing on. But it's not not truly free. Um, it, it takes time and effort to do it correctly. Yeah. Um, and it's not always the right channel, or at least it's not the only channel that you should be using. You should be going to wherever your audience is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I not think... just social media. <laughs> 
No, that's right. And even on social media, yes, you've got the organic posts, but don't discount paid posts as well because they can be just as effective, particularly if you've got a good content, what I would call a content asset, like a, a, a good solid document, like a white paper or a good vid, you know, a good how to or training type video. Yeah. Um, you know, that can be promoted very effectively using paid posts. Yes, yes, um, I agree. And um, and if you've got a really solid message that that that's about what your core audience really cares about. I, I mean, I've got great yeah. results um, from LinkedIn advertising, particularly. A lot, a lot of people dismiss it, say, oh, I've heard it's really expensive or um, it doesn't do very well. Well, if it hasn't been doing very well, it's obviously not been done right. <laughs> so yeah. it goes back to making sure you get the, 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 the uh, foundations right in the first place. And it, you shouldn't be thinking about it in terms of cost. You should be thinking uh, about it in terms of return on investment. Yes. Um, and it's the return on investment can be excellent. I've yeah. seen some amazing results from it. So, yeah. And I, I think, agree. yeah, and in the B2B space, I think people think they expect if they do some advertising, whether it's Google ads, LinkedIn advertising, whatever it might be, oh, we're going to be we have loads of responses. Well, actually, for most manufacturing, industrial, B2B type businesses, they're often not working quite niche markets. Yes. So you can promote a good, a really good asset on LinkedIn. And you might only get 20 or 30 downloads of it. But if they're the right 20 or 30 downloads, you know, and we I remember we ran something couple of years ago uh, for a company that was selling into the water industry there was a particular topical issue around phosphates as I recall at the time we produced some really solid content around that talking about the problems etc cetera, etc cetera. promoted it hard specifically through LinkedIn and specifically to the key decision makers in the water companies and we only got maybe I can't remember what it was 25 30 downloads something like that but it was from a number of the key decision makers and they ended up selling to them as a result so it wasn't it's it's about quality not quantity that's the key thing and coming back to your return on investment point of view yes the linkedin advertising cost them i don't know probably a few hundred quid or something like that um but each sale had a value of five to ten thousand pounds upwards yes, exactly yeah if you yeah. spend uh, 700 quid and you get a twenty thousand pound sale out, out of it you shouldn't be worrying about the 700 quid you've spent no and you know if you think about i mean you know a, a lot of people in the b2b marketplace are old enough to remember the days of print advertising mm. you know and you could in those days if you wanted a full page ad in in a trade publication it was a thousand pounds two thousand pounds three thousand pounds sometimes a page so why are we now quibbling about spending a few hundred pounds on linkedin yeah. sense of perspective seems to have gone and, and with and she, full, the, that full page um there's a bit you don't really know who's seen it no. or no, who, you right. can't drill down to the same level that you can in LinkedIn again we talk about those all you might have three adverts one for your your purchasing guys one for your engineers uh one for their managers um and you can drill down and make sure that they see what you want them to see with LinkedIn that's 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 um the other benefit over over print not to discount print at all sometimes that should no. be part of the mix no. um but 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 you know you know that the right people are going to see it. That's yeah. that's the beauty of it. Same, same with Facebook. You can get really granular with who you want to see it, and the same yeah. is true of LinkedIn. You can you can seniority. Uh, you can get the right job types, the right industry, the right company sizes. It's it's um, yeah, it's quite impressive at what you can yeah, do with it. Definitely, I think the, there's another another factor that's worth considering here is that most of us buy make it a buying decision emotionally yeah i know i do i'm a, I'm a bit yes. of a gadget freak so yes. you know i'll see something bright and shiny and think oh i like that i want that and then i'll justify buying it i'll rationalize it afterwards and this is the way the brain works you know you probably had a sort of system one two fast and slow yeah. thinking so i thought you know the emotive bit was the it sits on the fear and flight path really you know going back to when we were all stone age people um and it's a much faster decision making process yeah. the yeah. rational part of the brain is much much slower yeah. So we tend to make decisions quite quickly for all sorts of reasons. So when we're advertising, you're thinking about our LinkedIn advertising, or indeed, indeed our post, you've got images attached to that. Don't show a product picture. You know, that's going to be the next best thing to Mogadon for most people. Think about something that's going to capture their emotions. Yeah. You know, yes. not, and I don't mean something, you know, it doesn't have to be a Formula One car or a jet aircraft or whatever. It doesn't, but it's trying to find a way of engaging their emotions. 
so that they look at it and and there's that instant connection and yes. then they're more likely to click through um, yeah. and i think particularly in the b2b environment we tend to end up with an awful lot of very dry they might be beautifully technical pro photographs but they're very dry dull and boring and come back to my point earlier on i used to say to clients nobody cares about what you do nobody cares what your product looks like not to start with they might ultimately but they won't to start with yes i think there's this myth that in the b2b world especially especially if it's technical especially if you're talking to technical people they're very rational mm. it's very oh, dry yeah. that shouldn't be dealing with emotion and that's completely that's not true at all um oh, it might be a different set of emotions that you need to think about but uh you know they're human beings even if they're very yeah. technical people yeah. they are um emotional beings too and you do need to touch on that to, to to um to get attention it's not um you know what's keeping me up at night and, and, and sometimes you need to need to talk about the fact that something's keeping up on night. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, that's one thing that, that yeah, well, I did, one thing I work with clients when, if I'm doing a messaging workshop is to, okay, we've, we've figured out what their problems are. We figured out, um, uh, you know, what, what's special about you, what, what the crossover is, what your brand uh, proposition is. Now, what emotions do we need to be thinking about when we're creating content? And that's really powerful, I think. It's a, it's akin to, you know, if you think back with sort of good, successful salespeople, when they meet customers, prospective customers, they're the ones that spend time building rapport with the, the customer. They don't come in and suddenly start chatting about their product. Yeah. Excuse me. What they do is they come in and start talking about the customer as an individual. Yes. You know, I mean, and I'm not talking about the, the classic, oh, where are you going on holiday conversation? You know, it's a little bit more subtle than that. But good salespeople are very, very good at building rapport. So anyone they've done that, and started to get a good, a good feel for the individual and what their challenges are, et cetera, et cetera, they might eventually get round to saying, oh, well, we've been chatting for half an hour now, we've had a cup of coffee, maybe I better tell you why I'm here, which yes. was you know, to tell you a little bit about my product or service or whatever it might be. But they spend a lot of time digging beneath the kind of psyche of the, of the individual customer. So, you know, what you were just saying is, is kind of akin to the traditional sales process, a good yes. sales process anyway. And again, sales and marketing should be aligned. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there is no point sending out marketing messages that are contrary to what your salespeople are talking about when they're going to talk to a customer. Yeah. Now, yeah. Or making promises. Marketing can sometimes end up making lots of promises that the product can't keep or the service can't meet. And then the poor old sales team are kind of, you know, the customer will say, oh, I've saw this advert for your product the other day on LinkedIn. It says it can do X, Y, and Z. And the sales guy is thinking, no, it can't. <laughs> or it can only do it in perfect laboratory condition, you know. Yes. <laughs> so uh, this is, again, a reason why sales and marketing need to talk to each other. Yes. Because you know? marketing might get a brief to, to promote a new product. We've got to launch this new product and these are the features and benefits, etc. Great. So they come up with a great campaign, but it doesn't resonate with the messaging the salespeople are then putting out yes, into the marketplace. And sometimes as well, by working early on on that brief with a new product launch, by working together, sales are in a much better position to say to marketing uh -uh, that's the wrong route to go down if you if you go down that route nobody's going to take taking notice because what's really important to customers is not the fact that this product is 50 percent smaller or whatever it might be it's actually that it can respond far quicker therefore whatever the outcome is our product the, the customer's product is a quality product is going to be better or whatever it might be yeah 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 absolutely absolutely um, so is there anything else that we should, should touch on talking about inbound marketing? I know we've mentioned, mentioned marketing automation, which is another thing I don't think everyone that is going to be watching this video will know what it is. Is that something we should uh, briefly talk about? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned HubSpot. HubSpot is a great product, but it's one of many marketing automation yeah. platforms. Um, uh, I know HubSpot quite well, so I'll talk about that one if I may. But what I'm going to yeah. say about HubSpot will apply to Pardot Marketo. Yeah. Et al. It's, it's a modular product that sort of consists of a marketing module, sales module, and if you need it, a customer service module. So you've got an integrated platform that can handle basically all of the customer journey yeah. from an initial point of I've got a problem to sale and beyond. Um, the beauty of something like HubSpot or any of the other products is that 
as the term implies, it allows you to automate a lot of things. So I'm sure most people will have, have gone online and made an inquiry about something and instantly or almost instantly in their inbox pops up a, a thank you email. And oh, if you're interested in this, then you might also like to look at blah, blah, blah. And then a week later, you get something else. And if you click on one particular link, you get something that says, ah, if you're interested in this, then you might also be interested in that. That's all part of the market, the, the automation function. Now, for a lot of companies, that can be overkill. You know, HubSpot and all these other platforms are not particularly cheap. They are, yeah. And there are a lot cheaper tools out there that are more kind of e basic email marketing tools. Um, and I'm not so familiar with those, but there's a lot of them out there. I think yeah, MailChimp is quite widely used, well, like isn't it? It's an active campaign. I think that's $70 a month or something. It's sort of between yeah. HubSpot on your um, MailChimp. Yeah, yeah. So there's quite a lot of tools out there. I think you, you have to look at each each company has to look at these on their merits and de decide on actually what's most important for us. And sometimes it's worth starting at the low end, testing it, just doing some email marketing, maybe link it into your website if you can, um, see how it goes, develop your skills, and then as time goes on and your skill levels improve and the needs change and you can see more um, potential from automating more, you can then say, right, let's move from product A to product B. Or if it's one of the scalable ones, and there are even HubSpot scalable, there's, I yeah. think there's a an entry level model module which is free just on the marketing side yeah the you can CRM upscale thing, yeah. yeah yeah that's right Same with so, i think they've got a free version right the email mm. yeah. yeah 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 so so you can start off so, yeah start off small and build it up that's de definitely uh, yeah and, and it's, it's great for if i it's not just the cost you've got to look at as well it's how much because it's automation how much time is it going to save yeah absolutely yeah because it might be you know 500 dollars a month or something but if it saves you two days a week yeah <laughs> <It's valuable. laughs> when you if it means yeah you, yeah if it means your sales guys have more time to be out in front of the customer instead of sitting there at their desk doing the paperwork yeah. then brilliant yeah. yeah and a lot of these you know a lot of larger organizations will be using something like salesforce yeah and Salesforce, I think, has probably got its own marketing tool as well, but it will also integrate quite well with HubSpot, Marketo, and some of these other platforms. So, you know, if the sales team are already used to using something like Salesforce, then bolting on a marketing automation system around it is straight, relatively straightforward. And they, and if they're using Salesforce correctly, they've got the sort of mindset of keeping things up to date, using the information that's in there. And it's a great tool because you know, if if you're you're um you have a product like this you can score you can lead score through it so basically you can look at the individuals and say what interaction have they had with my business online okay well i can see through hubspot or whatever that they've looked at these six web pages and the six pages are all product related or all, or they're really interested in this particular area of application aerospace or whatever so that when the time comes for a salesperson to have a conversation with them, they can look at those levels of interaction and think to themselves, all right, I'm not starting this conversation with this prospect cold because I can see that they're interested in aerospace. I've looked at their own website, which should be a default, but not always, it doesn't always happen. I can see they're in the aerospace sector. Great. I can see that they're manufacturing for the MOD or something. Therefore, I know they're going to have potentially procurement challenges or whatever it might be. Um, and you can then relate that back to what they're doing on your own website or social media channels, yeah. the downloads they may have made, the videos they may have watched. And you can start to use that to inform the conversation that you open with, with the prospective customer so that you actually make it sound like you know about their business. Yes. <laughs> And not not saying, uh, oh, I see you've done X, Y, and Z on our website. Like, they, no, <laughs> that's a bit like creepy. Being watched, but, yeah. but you have that an idea. And also, I think what's um, something that's powerful is um, that you mentioned the the lead scoring. Most of these systems can have a, an alert set up, so if they hit a certain yeah. score based on their interactions, whether you know, kick through an email or you know, sign uh, download white papers, etc., and hit hit a certain score. That can go through to the relevant salesperson who can pick up the phone as though it was a cold call. And have you heard about this stuff that we already know you're interested in? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I made the comment earlier on right at the beginning that, you know, I'm not saying cold calling is dead. It's just not as effective as it used yes. to be. Um, when I was running the agency, um, I was always flabbergasted at the number of people that would, would call 
to try and sell something to us who hadn't done the basic research. Mm, yeah. So, for example, we were in serviced offices. It was a big block of offices that all of them yeah. were serviced in there. You know, it was known locally for being serviced offices. And yet we'd always get calls from people trying to sell us office furniture or telephone systems or whatever it might be. Yeah. Yep, no. I get that. <laughs> yeah, and so they never got they never got through to me. In fact, if they'd done the research properly, I had an operations director. She handled all of that, that stuff, so they should have been ringing her anyway. Um, but you often find that people will try and sell you something that you don't need because they've not done their research properly. Yeah, or what? But if somebody... I get people trying to sell me what I do. Yes, that's even more bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but if they would, if they were ringing you and saying um you know i can see you're a, a small business your time is obviously valuable to you can we help to free up some of your time perhaps by taking some of your workload off you so that you can focus on more in, on on the parts of the business where you can add greater value to your customers etc yeah. maybe that's more of a conversation yeah yeah exactly exactly and it, it comes back to doing that foundation work in the first place it does. yeah yeah, yeah where absolutely. this ties this ties in is is that's invaluable to sales guy they've got all this information they already know yeah yeah um so that's that's another thing to think about and nurturing leaders and and, and the other thing uh we've mentioned is, is it's automation but you can do have it set up to do certain things based on mm -hmm. the different behavior you can have yeah um uh, um different flow uh email flows and so on uh, even mailchimp does email flows where you know if, if they clicked on this send the missing email if they haven't sent the missing email this that kind of thing yeah that uh, very much either or type yes kind of approach yeah and i think you're right about different content at different stages we've talked about the customer mm. journey but you can reflect that in your marketing yes. automation system so yes. if somebody's downloaded a stick with my light bulb analogy how do i change a light bulb and they've downloaded a or read a blog or downloaded a piece of content that tells them that they're probably at the early stages so that means that what do you follow that up with well perhaps something else that, that reinforces the message about light bulb changing or maybe it says to them okay so now you know how to change a light bulb did you know there are all sorts of these different light bulbs you can get an led one a halogen one or this that and the other one um whereas somebody who might perhaps download a product data sheet is probably a bit further down the customer journey so they might need a different type of content you know they might need a case study that actually says um learn how customer x has been using our product one two three four five to improve their life productivity quality whatever so yes and you can do all that in the marketing automation system but you've come back to something you said a few minutes ago you've got to do your due your planning and your research and your understanding up front yeah, um, yeah and i'd add to that just because you've done all that gone through that process once don't think it's finished it's constantly evolving people yes. change customers change clients change so you've got to go back and revisit that from time yes. to time i use um a process called um there are loads of different ones out there but i use something called sauce stack right yeah uh, and the last one is control it's, it's not a linear it's a circle mm -hmm. uh um uh, the first one is situations that come, that's very much what we were talking about make sure that you've done your research first uh, yeah. objectives know what it is you want to achieve um strategy uh um tactics action and then the last one is control right which is all about what's worked what hasn't what's changed and yeah. then you go back to the situation again yeah and it's a con continuous cycle you know you, you you should always have you need your three five ten year plans but you also need to have your one two year plans and 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 even within the year check what's working and what's not yeah, and just absolutely. it's yeah, yeah. continual thing. and i think the challenge is for a lot of people um is that they accept the status quo mm. as in the status quo bias i don't mean as in for those that can remember them the band <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> um you know, it, what we've been doing for the last six months has now become the norm. It's become the status quo. We changed yeah. what we were doing six months ago. Now it's become the status quo. It's working okay. We're happy. But what they never do is go back and revisit it and say, so we've never been using it for six months. What can we do now to make it better, to improve it? You know, yeah. they just, because other, other priorities come along and they get sidetracked. Um, and this can be one of the challenges as well, of course, if you're trying to sell to those sorts of people or market to those sorts of people that are, that are embedded in the status quo, it's very hard to change their mind. So you've really got to have a compelling offer 
which comes back to understanding the market and all the other things we talked about. And a lot of people have a bit of a fear of change. Uh, oh, they're more without thinking a doubt. about what could go wrong than what they're yeah. missing out on sometimes. Yeah, there was there's a, a stat I can't remember. I think it was the guy called Daniel Kahneman, I think, um, who did some work. But he um, concluded that people are two and a half times more risk averse. So basically, if you want somebody to change, and you, what you're offering them is potentially to them risky, you've got to be able to demonstrate an improvement in whatever it is at least two and a half times over and above what they're already doing before they'll even consider changing people are risk averse by nature um yes. and you know trying to get people to change away from the status quo can be very very difficult yes. um, and there's also the other element too, there's, a, there's a, a i can't remember what the bias is called but um it's basically where because we've already invested our time and energy in this new solution I'm not going to consider anything else because I'm too heavily invested oh, in it, course. even if it's not working. Yeah. Yeah. The very yeah. common, very common. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the number. I'm trying to break out the office. That's what I'm <laughs> <here>. <laughs> I think. I think he's heard some, something interesting in there. Uh, I think my other house probably got a snack or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's really brilliant information. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. And, and before we go, have you got anything to plug, anything that you'd like to uh, let people know about? Well, I mentioned that I ran the agency for 40 years. I'm now working as, as an independent marketing consultant. Um, so I tend to specialise in working with smaller industrial manufacturing businesses, SMEs, who may lack internal marketing expertise and need some help strategically. But also um, I do a lot of technical copywriting. So you mentioned blog posts earlier on. Um, I do a lot of what I would call technical blog posts, white papers, case studies, all those types of things. So again, we, uh, we've both we sort of touched on it, haven't we? we? People are very busy, and sometimes they can write the, the materials themselves. But actually, it's more cost effective somebody to give it to a specialist who understands the technology, understands the subject, turn it around in a reasonable time frame. Um, it can go online, job done, you know, and they can focus on other things. So yeah, I'm working as an independent consultant. Uh, for across a number of areas but fundamentally manufacturing businesses brilliant okay well i will be putting nick's links uh in in uh, Thank you. on the website where i will be hosting this so check that out and uh yeah brilliant thank you very much nick you're welcome thank you very much <laughs>